Hello, folks. Welcome back to <coughs> Introduction to Literary Criticism. This will be a video lecture for Module 6 over Marxism, which is due this coming Monday, the 21st. Uh, as usual, I will proceed in the order of the readings in the module. Um, so there are only three questions this time, as opposed to the four of feminism last time. So A, B, and C, there's this little diagram I'll explain in letter A. So let's uh, look at the handout on Marxism. Um, <clears throat> so if you think all the way back to say structuralists, uh, you know, Sassur and Levi Strauss, um, they believed or they assumed that the existence of language was required for any kind of reality, that uh, reality was constructed or uh, produced by language. And therefore language is the be all and end all for structuralists. Um, and last time when we were talking about feminism, the focus is of course on uh, one's sex and or gender, depending on how it's construed by the feminist. Um, and psychoanalytic criticism, of course, Freud and Lacan, they believe, of course, that reality is, you know, predicated upon what's in your head, uh, you know, your consciousness or unconscious, as Marx, uh, Freud would say. So when we get to Marxism and Marxist criticism, they instead they believe that economics uh, is the root of human existence, not language, not sex, gender, not uh, what's in your mind, but really what we now come to term as class, uh, you know, your income level, and thus you know driven by economics. Um, an important issue that arises that I will talk about and Barry talks about uh, is ideology. Um, it is not the study of ideas as the word itself might suggest, but it is simply put uh, a worldview or mindset uh, and how it occurs in what we as human beings uh, do with it and for it uh, becomes of paramount importance for Marxists. Um, so very kind of roughly speaking, this is a, on the second page of this handout, um, this is a kind of simplified reductive structure of Marxist theory. Um, if you want to think of, you know, this structure as a house, top and bottom. But notice uh, before we talk about these, you know, top and bottom or the base and the superstructure, notice that there are arrows and it is suggesting that these two categories of superstructure and base are interdependent, symbiotic, that uh, they really can't uh, sort of like uh, the Bamorian knot of Lacan, they can't uh, exist without each other. So the base is starting with that. It's probably the easiest to understand. It's, um, you know, where the ruling class, the people who own the means of production, so to speak, uh, they, have their factories, their you know machines, land, raw materials, and so on, uh, and that's owned by 
you know, the wealthy class, the 1%, we might say, um, and we work within the base. We as uh, laborers or the proletariat, he will say. So this is the kind of fundamental structure, if you will, of economics for Marx. Uh, things that you can touch, you know, factories, land, you know, lumber, machines, and so on, that laborers do in fact touch on a daily basis. However, things that are sort of intangible uh, are up here called the superstructure, the categories of education, family, religion, mass media, which includes many, many things now with social media and the internet, uh, politics, government, and so on. And these work not tangibly necessarily as you know the factories and uh, machines do, but they work intangibly, abstractly through our minds, which produces ideology. So we will come back to these terms when we're talking about uh, Barry and then later Marx. Um, so briefly, uh, let me just kind of give you an idea of what we're going to range through here by looking at some images. So here's Marx, uh, Karl Marx, who was a Prussian, now part of Germany, uh, born to a Jewish family. His father converted to Protestantism to save his job. Uh, but, you know, fundamentally a, what we might otherwise call a German Jew in his background. Um, his counterpart and co-author is Friedrich Engels and uh, Friedrich Engels is a Brit. Uh, they're writing in the mid 1800, the, <clears throat> excuse me, mid 1800s, the uh, middle of the 19th century. So one of the things that uh, you know, we have to talk about is kind of separating what Marx and Engels wrote from what has later been co-opted by socialist and communist regimes like the so former Soviet Union or uh, Cuba or China to a certain degree, a certain way. Um, and we can do that by thinking about, uh, as Althus Serre, whom we'll talk about later, talks about these ideological state apparatuses and these repressive state apparatuses. So, um, you know, we are all part of a capitalist system in the quote unquote free market world but there's a price to be paid for that. Uh, another way to think about it is, uh, you know, what kind of societies we have, whether they are liberal or whether they are conservative, uh, but they all have these elements of ideological state apparatuses. Um, one of the basic principles or tenets that is discussed in both Barry and in Marx is this notion of ideology, as I mentioned, but the metaphor that is used is what is called the camera obscura, which is, you know, this basic scientific principle of, as being showed here in this uh, 17th century woodcut, where you, you know, have a pinhole to allow light in but then on the wall where the light is projected, whatever is outside is inside where the image is projected on the wall is upside down. And therefore ideology is upside down consciousness or false consciousness as Marx would say. So uh, you can try this at home. It's a very simple project. You may have done it in school basic uh, optics or physics, 
um, it's what occurs in a actual camera, right? Uh, or most cameras, that is you have a mirror, you know, inside that uh, takes the, you know, so you have the, the image, the person or landscape out here that is of course correct or right side up. And then um, it is bounced off a mirror and that image then if you saw it right away, as in the preceding, as you're looking at this old daguerreotype uh, photograph uh, uh, camera, then it would be upside down. But in digital cameras and SLR cameras these days, there's yet another uh, prism or uh, mirror through which it is then in your viewfinder you know, projected the right way. So angles here, again, you know, the counterpart to Marx says, if in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from the physical life process. So it's in a nutshell what they are saying uh, using the metaphor of the camera obscura. So um, a number of things we will talk about when we get to Althusser, especially are how all of these ideological state apparatuses, uh, you know, like capitalism and the banks, about uh, various you know social structures, your even your physical neighborhood subdivisions or urban or rural, uh, your healthcare and of course your education, they're all interconnected and they're all part of the ideological state apparatus system according to Althusser. Uh, there are different ways to look at this, you know, if you may have covered this in social theory and sociology or courses like that, uh, you know, you're you and your family are at the center and then it kind of extends outward in this onion layered set of networks of entities and agencies and uh, processes. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that Marx is really concerned about is the little guy is us down here. Um, this was, uh, I don't know if you can, see, but uh, it was uh, down at the bottom, a 1911 uh, poster by the uh, International Workers Union. <clears throat> and what it is showing here is this kind of hierarchical structure from the bottom to the top of how capitalism works. And remember, unless you're in say China or perhaps Venezuela, Cuba, uh, the entire globe is, you know, largely a capitalist set of networked economies. <clears throat> so down here, we will work for all, right? We, the workers, the proletariat, you can see this dead person because, you know, literally working yourself to death. Um, then above you, or us, I should say, because I work for a living. And <laughs> unless you're uh, perhaps like these people here, uh, the owners of the means of production, what um, Marx will call the bourgeoisie. Uh, and so down here are the proletariat, the working class, and up here, the, the owners of the factories, the means of production. Uh, and they will eat for us, right? Because <laughs> we as workers provide them with food and pleasure. And, you know, they're literally, uh, we're, we, are, we are literally selling our labor to them for their existence. Uh, above them to keep, you know, these two classes from, you know, getting out of hand and one <clears throat> rioting or, you know, overthrowing the other class, uh, you have, you know, we shoot at you. You, you have what 
Althusser calls the repressive state apparatuses, which include, you know, certainly the military, but also police and courts and the judicial system, you know, in general, that keep things in line. Above this, uh, to maintain people's social structure and order, um, this image is showing, you know, we fool you. Uh, that is to say, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, that is to say the class, uh, like the clergy, the church, uh, people who indoctrinate you to believe uh, certain things and therefore behave in certain ways, right? Thou shalt not X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then at the very top are what we otherwise might call the 1%, you know, the financiers, the bankers, uh, people who really own the system. So this uh, image here is still in play today. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of income wealth gap, you know, that is the top 1% own, you know, some ridiculous, like 80% or more of the entire global wealth, um, which, you know, is pretty horrendous if you think about it. Here's another way to imagine this, but uh, a different kind of, same, same structure, just different uh, iconic form, if you will. There's uh, the base and superstructure again. Um, so here's Althusser, we'll talk about him later. Uh, he's a kind of proponent and disciple in a certain way of Marx. And here's what he's fundamentally arguing that um, the up here <clears throat> diagram of RSAs and ISAs, repressive state apparatus and ideological state apparatus. Um, the ruling class, the uh, you know, bourgeoisie, the 1%, um, they force us through education, media, religion, judicial system, family, and so on, um, to conform to certain behaviors and practices uh, in order to produce labor for them, right? Uh, again, you can see down here, false class consciousness, which is ideology, because, you know, that's fundamentally what's at work here to keep us in line is, you know, we believe we have to, you know, work for the man, so to speak. Um, one of the sort of offshoots, if you will, of um, Marxism is this concern with, of course, the state, capital S, uh, or government uh, being all up in our business, right? And therefore, we get this term Big Brother, not to be confused with the lame reality TV show Big Brother, but a term that came from um, George Orwell, you've seen here, uh, his novel, 1984. Uh, Big Brother is government uh, being so pervasively uh, aware of what we're doing every you know, move, which has now come to pass um, because we now have uh, you know, these little things we carry around, smartphones that carry our GPS location. If the NSA or anyone else wants to know exactly where we are. Um, so, you know, he was predictive back in the 1940s. Uh, you know, he was writing this novel, but it was set in 1984, you know, decades ahead. But here we are in the early 21st century and what he has predicted has certainly come to pass. Um, and there's this plaque outside where he used to live in London. And ironically, you can see here, there's, you know, a surveillance camera because people would vandalize and try to take the plaque. But, you know, that's, that's his whole point. The big brother of the government is watching you. Um, one of the issues that is brought up by Marxism is 
uh, regardless of what government or state you have, whether it's you know a you know a Donald Trump radically right wing president or Barack Obama, whom I voted for twice, uh, according to Marxist theory and Althusser, for example, that there really is no choice between red or blue, right? Uh, I didn't make these images, but you can see that um, the point is, is um, regardless of which government it is, you know, you still are required to obey that government. Um, you know, if it's a democratic president or a Republican president, they are still the commander in chief, you know, they still uh, rule the land. Um, this is a famous line that comes from uh, the Communist Manifesto about nothing to lose but our chains, uh, meaning workers have nothing to lose but our chains, because as Marx and Marxism uh, views it, uh, there is a class struggle that not only does happen, but necessarily must happen to overthrow um, the powers that be and uh, capitalism in general. Um, so various civil disobedient protests have occurred uh, and you know, continue to occur. Um, and Marxism is all about that, right? It's saying that that's what workers and those who have not uh, need to do. Uh, a few years ago, 2015, there was a what's called Occupy Wall Street movement that was trying to deliberately point out the income inequality gap by looking at you know, the main financiers on Wall Street. And so they literally occupied um, Wall Street and Zuccotti Park and Square. But of course, the I ISA and RSA uh, ideological and repressive state apparatuses did not like that, right? We are the 99% because, and again, unless you are the owners of the mean of, means of production or the top 1%, you are the 99%. We, we are the 99%. So the repressive state apparatuses, you know, law enforcement come in and they, you know, NYPD, uh, and they literally force you to conform. Right, because the one percent is afraid of losing its power, its wealth. These are all actual photos. This is a kind of famous one uh, happened in Portland, Oregon, also an Occupy Wall Street protest. But the law enforcement here, uh, you know, they're in like full riot gear with weapons and pepper spray against these completely unarmed civilians who are protesting, you know, the fact that uh, we need to, you know, for example, uh, have a fair income tax bracket where everyone pays the exact same amount. It shouldn't be graduated or as corporations, you know, make a killing by not paying anything. Um, and this young woman is getting her face, mouth, uh, right with pepper spray. That's your repressive state apparatus for you. This is another famous scene. Uh, this happened at uh, uh, University of California, Davis. Um, also at the same time, Occupy Wall Street movements. Now these are completely harmless students locked <clears throat> arm in arm protesting as is your First Amendment right, right? But the chancellor or because University of California calls a university president, a chancellor instead of president, as Gramling does. Um, the chancellor of UC Davis uh, claimed that they were on the sidewalk and uh, therefore they were preventing, in the case of a fire, a fire truck from uh, moving down the sidewalk. So they had to be removed, even though they weren't hurting anyone. Uh, and they gave them warnings and they just still didn't move. So she called the campus police and the campus police came out there with pepper spray and literally pepper sprayed people right in the face to make them 
move. Uh, and that quickly became, this image here became a meme uh, that people, you know, uh, kind of parody. Uh, but, you know, here, this is, you know, this someone with a gas mask, right? This is, this is what democracy looks like, you know, our, and holding up, you know, the uh, king and others walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, saying, yeah, this is what democracy looks like. You know, you have the repressive state apparatus forcing you to conform to their will. Um, yeah, again, these memes that people made. So, um, yeah, that's kind of kind of accurate, actually. Um, another example of uh, the repressive state apparatus at work was in the late 1960s uh, during the civil rights and also Vietnam War uh, movements, anti-Vietnam War movements. Um, there was in uh, Kent, Ohio, uh, Kent State University, there was this protest, you know, anti-war protest, but uh, the National Guard was called out by the governor and these young and experienced you know, not actual active duty soldiers came out and they ended up opening fire on the students, right? And ended up killing, I think, nine people. Uh, this is a sort of iconic photograph on that scene. This young woman lost her friend. Um, so I just want to give you a, you know idea of what we're gonna be kind of ranging through when we talk about Marx here. Um, let's move to the Barry chapter. Um, so Marx and Engels, as I mentioned, um, and here he, he rightly kind of uh, is, you know, we need to do kind of parse out uh, the difference between sort of Marxism and communism, right? They call themselves, or called their economic theories communism rather than Marxism designating their belief in the state ownership of industry, transport, et cetera, rather than private ownership. Marx and Engels announced the advent of communism in their jointly written Communist Manifesto of 1848. So this is why uh, capitalists, Republicans, <laughs> Or, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, uh, anyone who uh, is in favor of capitalism uh, thinks that communism is a bad idea, which is to say, we currently have you know, private ownership of transportation, of industry, of uh, you know, pretty much all goods and services, except that which is owned by the government. And that would be things like, you know, the military or uh, like, for example, the Department of Transportation, which is an agency of the government, uh, you know, the state, and I'll use those terms interchangeably, government and state. Um, it doesn't actually own anything other than it's, you know, sort of vehicles to repair the roads, right? Um, the roads themselves are owned by each individual of 50 states that we in turn, you know, supply tax dollars to. Um, but, you know, if you're a bourgeois land or industry owner, factory owner, uh, you don't want state ownership, right? That you don't want the government coming in and taking over your factory. You want it to be in private ownership so you can you know, exploit your labor and earn a profit, right? That's what capitalism is all about. Um, the aim of Marxism is to bring about a classless society. So imagine that, right? That there is no upper, lower, middle income or whatever. It's just everyone has the same. <laughs> a classless society based on the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. So the state or the government owns everything, right? There's, you know, like every, you don't ask like, well, how much are you making? Cause you already know, everyone's making the same amount. Marxism 
is a materialist philosophy. That is, it tries to explain things without assuming the existence of a world or of forces beyond the natural world around us and the society we live in. It looks for concrete, scientific, logical explanations of the world of observable fact. Its opposite is idealist philosophy, which does believe in the existence of a spiritual world elsewhere and would offer, for instance, religious explanations of life and conduct. But whereas other philosophers merely seek to understand the world, Marxism and Marx famously seeks to change it. So um, let's think about that, right? That when we talk about materialist or materialism, uh, we're talking about the physical world in which we live shaping our reality, as opposed to the other way in an idealist world, having say a religious explanation, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, uh, some other sacred text saying, here's what the truth is. And now you can go live your life accordingly, right? Um, so Marx sort of famously said that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. Uh, if you, you know, opium and opioids, they dull your senses. They, uh, you know, don't allow you to see the reality in front of your face. Um, and that's exactly how according to Marx and Althusser, how the state wants it. They don't want you to realize that you are being exploited. Uh, continuing here, Marxism sees progress as coming through the struggle for power between different social classes. This view of history as class struggle rather than as, for instance, a succession of dynasties or as a gradual progress toward the attainment of national identity or sovereignty uh, regards it as motored or engineered by the competition for economic, social, and political advantage, right? That competition is the driver of the class struggle. The exploitation of one social class by another is, especially, is seen especially in modern industrial capitalism, particularly in its unrestricted 19th century form when there were no labor laws, right? You had literal child labor. So the result of this exploitation is alienation, which is the state that comes about when the worker is de-skilled and made to perform fragmented repetitive tasks in a sequence of whose nature and purpose he or she has no overall grasp. So think of your, your typical factory worker or meat processing plant worker. They're literally standing in one place all day, every day doing the same exact repetitive work. You know, as a conveyor and they just kind of do their particular task, put on a gear here, put on a fender there, or you know, cut this part of the cow or sheep or whatever, and then it moves on, you know, in just a, a kind of dehumanizing way. And therefore, you know, you really don't have any of your own at the end of the day thing that you produced. Like, you know, you're not carving a wooden bowl to sell. You're not, you know, on a potter's wheel throwing some clay and making pottery and selling that at a, you know, some kind of show or festival. Um, your labor is what is being, you know, given by the worker. Um, these alienated workers have undergone the process of reification, which is a term Marx used. Uh, which is a term used in Marx's words, das Kapital, but not developed there. It concerns the way when capitalist goals and questions of profit and loss are paramount, which is true in capitalism, the ways in which workers are bereft, you know, they're stripped of their full humanity and are thought of as hands or the labor force. So that for instance, 
the effect of industrial closures, you know, closing factories, are calculated in purely economic terms. People, in a word, become things. And in fact, that is so prevalent in our culture today because who's in charge of your paycheck and hiring and firing in every sort of, even in, you know, university is called human resources. That is, humans are a resource for whichever company, organization, or entity, right? You, we are things. Um, so German philosopher Hegel, especially his idea of the dialectic. Um, so let me just, uh, we're gonna have to come back to, to that, but uh, we mentioned this in the, uh, or I discuss this in the psychoanalytic module, um, but it's kind of helpful to know because this, this is sort of the notion of Marx's idea of the class struggle that you know not only continues but it needs to happen, right? So the basic idea from uh, George Hegel, the German philosopher, uh, is that there is some idea, some thesis. And then there is its opposite. And those two clash and it causes a crisis, but then there's some kind of resolution in the synthesis. synthesis. And that um, occurs throughout history, Hegel says, in this dialectic, okay? And, you know, we're seeing it right now in Ukraine. So there's this, you know, free state of Ukraine that wants to remain free. So that's the thesis. The antithesis is what Putin wants, which is basically an autocracy, a fascist regime like, you know, Nazi Germany or fascist Italy in the World War II. Uh, so th those two ideas are clashing, right? And now we have a crisis, a war, because, you know, he's pushing the argument to its logical conclusion, know that, no, I don't want this free state of Ukraine on my doorstep. I want to take it back because it used to belong to Russia. Uh, and we will have some kind of synthesis, uh, whether it's, you know, in the West's or European favor or not, right? But it will at some point be resolved, um, as all wars are eventually. Um, so, let me move on here. Uh, this is the notion of the superstructure, which I mentioned. <laughs> the simplest Marxist model of society sees it as con constituted by the base, the material means of production, distribution, and exchange, and a superstructure, which is the cultural world of ideas, art, religion, law, and so on. The essential Marxist view is that the latter, the superstructure, things, are not innocent but are determined or shaped by the nature of the economic belief. And so going back to this image here, remember I said that you see these arrows on the sides, right? That they are interdependent, right? Linked to each other. Um, that is, you know, what the, the owners, the bourgeoisie who own the means of production, you know, the 1%, if you will, what they want is to create you know, to use Susan Bordeaux's term of the body uh, and really playing off Foucault's idea, they want docile workers. They want malleable, complicit workers. They don't want people to not do their job, right? So um, this is known as economic determinism, that what the, up here, the, you know, uh, uh, where is it? The world of ideas, art, and religion, and law, and so on. <clears throat> what that is comprised of are things that the economic base wants, right? Again, think of, you know, if I remind you of that RSA image of New York PD and police, you know, shoving people out of Zuccotti Park in New York City because they're occupying Wall Street, right? They're, 
you know, they're part of the law, right? But that is, you know, they're functioning at the behest of the one percent or those who own the means of production. Um, okay, so what I love about Marxism is, you know, I'm yeah, an avowed Marxist in a kind of cultural materialist way. Um, is that once you learn about it, uh, you know, once you, <laughs> the veil is lifted, so to speak, that everything is always political and everything is automatically indebted to economics, um, <clears throat> that, excuse me, it becomes impossible to read or see things in the world without automatically being aware of economics and class. So in literary criticism, we think about um, the ways in which the author, the text reveal issues of, you know, struggle uh, of various kinds of class issues. So instead of seeing authors as primarily autonomous inspired individual, individuals whose genius and creative imagination enables them to bring forth original and timeless works of art. So instead of seeing them like the new critics did, think of T.S. Eliot, you know, the timelessness and tradition of the past, the Marxist sees them, sees authors as constantly formed by their social, and I would say economic contexts in which they themselves would usually not admit that the way in which authors might go, well, yeah, I wrote this novel, but you know, here's what I was trying to get <clears throat> or trying to convey. And a Marxist critic will go, but yes, you wrote it in this particular location with this particular educational background uh, with this amount of time, because you also had to work in a real job, you know, like all of these actual materialist concerns are poured into reading a literary work. This is <clears throat> true not just of the content of their work, but even of formal aspects of their writing, which might at first seem to have no possible political overtones. <clears throat> and what they're saying here, and they mean by formal, is not, you know, level of diction, but is that literal form, like are you writing a novel, a short story, nonfiction, or in poetry, are you writing you know, an epic poem or a sonnet or, you know, whatever genre. That's what we mean by form here. Um, and so what Marxist critics will also talk about is, you know, whatever form uh, in visual arts, we would call it medium, whatever form you have adopted in literature uh, can be read or interpreted as also buying into like, oh, well, if you write a sonnet, what you were doing is you were, participating in a very long kind of lofty and almost elitist uh, literary art form, right? It's a very kind of rigid style of 14 lines with, you know, amic pentameter and rhyming, you know, couplets perhaps, or, uh, you know, another rhyme scheme if you're using the Italian or Petrarchan sonnet. Um, so the form, not just, you know, what the author is saying can be read. Um, So, uh, traditional Marxist criticism tends to deal with history in a fairly generalized way. It talks about conflicts between social classes and classes of large historical forces, but contrary to popular belief, it rarely discusses the detail of a specific historical situation and relates it closely to the interpretation of a particular literary text. Um, more and more that's, uh, I would say, not entirely the case. Uh, there are a number of uh, cultural critics, cultural Marxists who are reading um, history in a very kind of specific way. Uh, there's a famous book by James Chandler uh, about the early British Romantic era called, it's just entitled 1814. And it, it's a sort of like really deep dive into that entire year. Um, 
but yeah, generally speaking, you know, uh, Marxists tend to kind of look at broad historical issues when they're talking about texts. So um, in order to think about Marxist criticism, we need to remember that uh, Marx and Engels, their writing was read by and then co-opted, meaning reinterpreted by later state government leaders like Vladimir Lenin here. Um, so, um, you know, keep in mind, I, I don't know if you guys know, but in, you know, 1917, uh, right on the, you know, kind of, well, right during uh, World War I, uh, the Bolsheviks in, 1917, they overthrew uh, Tsar Nicholas and his family, right? <clears throat> Let's see here. So, yeah, the October, because it happened in October 1917. Um, so Lenin was the, you know, later, you know, Bolshevik leader out of this revolution, but it was a pretty, uh, you know, brutal kind of revolution. Uh, exactly what the current 1% doesn't want, right? The owners of the media, they don't, they don't want this. They don't want, you know, their powers to be taken and, uh, you know, them being overthrown by a bunch of, you know, lower class military people, right? Um, militia, we might say. Anyway, so this is just three years later. In the 1920s, during the early years after the revolution in Russia, <clears throat> the official Soviet attitude to literature and the arts was very enlightened and experimental. <clears throat> Characteristically, modern forms of art were encouraged. Right, so it was the 1920s. However, in the 1930s saw reaction throughout the whole of the so Soviet society and the state, the government, began to exert direct control over literature and the arts, as well as everything else. At first, the Soviet Writers' Congress in 1934, <laughs> liberal views were outlawed and a new orthodoxy imposed based on the writings of Lenin rather than those of Marx and Engels. Lenin had argued in 1905 that literature must become an instrument of the party, that is the Bolshevik party. Literature, he said, must become party literature. So um, that has still not gone away, which is to say currently in Russia, they have uh, severely limited access to outside <clears throat> information about what is going on in Ukraine so that the Russian people inside of Russia, unless they try very hard with VPNs and whatnot, um, they're just being fed what is uh, on the state run, the government run uh, television and, and radios. Uh, they don't have access to Facebook or Instagram. It's all been shut down. And therefore, the state ends up controlling what they think and how they think about, you know, well, yeah, we're, we're really not hurting Ukrainians that poorly or badly, right? And so literature and art, or you might say art in general, because literature is a type of art, um, becomes co-opted, right, or used for the agenda of the state or government when it is uh, thought to, you know, look after or reinforce, I should say, <laughs> what the 1% or the powers that be or Putin wants, right? Um, however, if it threatens or challenges you know, kind of criticizes the state or the government or Putin, right? Then it's immediately shut down and those people are either imprisoned and or killed, which 
is going on in Russia, uh, right? <clears throat> so that's one way of thinking about Marxist criticism about to what degree does literature work in the service of the state or is it allowed to within the government, within the state, is it allowed to criticize the government? And that's one of the hallmarks of, of, of America is that we have the right, if not the duty or obligation, to point out the flaws and problems with American government. Um, so, Uh, let me move on to Althusser here. Um, we'll look at each one of these authors individually, Marx and Althusser. Remember, um, he's a Marxist um, by sort of, you know, training, if you will, uh, but, but French. And he adds a whole new kind of chapter, if you will, in Marx and Engels writing. And it's basically uh, his notion of the ISAs and RSAs. Um, hold on. Let's see, 165, where's that? Okay. <clears throat> so um, one of the concepts he, develops is this notion of overdeterminism. Um, think of network, really. Uh, so it's a word borrowed from Freud, which designates an effect which rises from a variety of causes, not one cause, that is from several causes acting together rather than from a single, in this case, economic factor. So, you know, you don't just have uh, what determines this person's psychosis and Freudian psychology or psychoanalysis? Uh, it's not just this one thing. It is uh, depression. It is ADD. It is, uh, you know, uh, chemical imbalance. It is, you know, like a network of things. And each one of those determines the outcome of that person's neuroses or psychosis or both. Um, in the same way here, Althusser is using the word overdeterminism or something that's overdetermined um, economically in the sense that there is not one single thing that determines your, uh, you know, lot or state in society. Uh, there are several things. And if we go back to the, the basic uh, analogy here, right, that all of these things in the superstructure here, uh, are in each line determining to a certain degree where you end up and how you end up in life. Uh, your family, you know, did you have two parents? Were those parents heterosexual? Uh, did you have, you know, uh, private, you know, expensive education or did you go to a public school or, you know, were you even educated? And had started early, or um, you know, did you go to college and so on? Uh, religion, did you belong to, or were you raised in a church at all? If so, was it a, you know, uh, in your community an accepted church, or was it considered on the fringes? Was it, you know, kind of uh, a, an outcast denomination? You know, were you a Satanist, <laughs> for example? Uh, you know, politics. You know. Uh, are you an independent thinker or are you, you know, just pull the lever on Republican or Democrat? Anyway, all of these have a line in determining uh, your fate, right? And so if it's determined one or more times, it becomes over-determined. It's a kind of long-winded way to explain that, sorry. Um, oh yeah, and here we get to the important idea of ideology. Um, so again, it's not you know the study of ideas, but here it is a system processing its logic and proper rigor of representations, which include images, myths, ideas, 
or concepts according to the case, endowed with an existence, an historical role at the heart of a given society. So you could even say, if you wanted to think of myths, right, that religion is a type of ideology, though, of course, religious believers would say, no, no, my faith is true. I can't show it to you or prove it to you, but I know it to be true. Uh, a Marxist would say, no, it's, it's just yet another ideology. Um, as are all you know, ways of believing, uh, they all are ideologies. So here's where we get into the RSAs and ISAs as Barry describes it. Althusser makes a useful distinction between what we might call state power and state control. State power, literally like power, is maintained by what Althusser terms repressive state apparatuses, which are institutions like law courts, prisons, the police force, and the army, which operate in the last analysis by external force, as you saw those images, right? Are literally forcing you physically to do something. But the power of the state is also maintained more subtly by seeming to secure the internal consent of its citizens, right? That we buy into it, we agree to it, using what Althusser calls ideological structures or state ideological apparatuses. These are such groupings as political parties, schools, the media, churches, the family and art, including literature, which foster an ideology, that is a set of ideas and attitudes, which is sympathetic to the aims of the state, to the goals of the government and the political status quo. Thus, each of us feels that we are freely choosing what is in fact being imposed upon us, right? <laughs> that like we go, oh yes, you know, in this election, I am going to vote for this candidate and I'm making a free will choice in doing so. But what Althusser is pointing out is that, well, you're still per participating in this, in America anyway, this two party system and the entire system itself, whether again, you know, it's a Democrat or Republican in the White House is all the same larger system that controls us. This Althusserian distinction is closely related to the notion of hegemony. Um, so hegemony is an is important uh, idea and uh, it's, it's basically, as it's described here, uh, it's used in different ways, but it, it fundamentally means, uh, you know, the powers that be and the ideas, the concepts that the powers that be want us to buy into. Uh, it is the whole lived social process that's practically organized by specific and dominant meanings, values, and beliefs of a kind which can be abstracted as a worldview or class outlook. Um, or hegemony is like an internalized form of social control which makes certain views seem natural or invisible so that they hardly seem like views at all, just the way things are, right? That's, that's just how it is, you know? It's just life, you might say. Um, the trick, and, and we are tricked, uh, according to Althusser and Marxists, the trick whereby we are made to feel we are choosing when really we have no choice is called by Althusser interpolation. Capitalism, says Althusser, thrives on this trick. It makes us feel like free agents, right? Like I'm gonna go to Walmart and buy this, I don't know, garden tool. You can have this garden tool or that garden tool, right? One manufacturer makes it, another manufacturer makes it, but it's, you know, it's still a garden tool that you're paying for with your hard-earned given labor, you know, the currency, the currency represents your labor. Um, you can have any color you like, right? Like think of uh, all the different kinds of blue jeans <laughs> while um, 
actually imposing things upon us as long as it's black, right? You can have you can have whatever color you want as long as it's black. It's sort of like the idea I was mentioning earlier, like you can vote for this Republican red candidate or liberal blue candidates, uh, but in the at the end of the day, it's still a candidate who's going to work within as an established system already. Thus, democracy makes us feel that we are choosing the kind of governance we have, but in practice, the difference between political parties once some power are far fewer than the rhetorical gulfs between them. Interpolation is also Sir's term for the way the individual is encouraged to see him or herself as an entity free of independent of social forces, which is never true. It accounts for the operation of control structures not maintained by physical force, right? Meaning like, you know, education and family and media and so on. Those aren't physical, but they're still controlling us. And hence the uh, perpetuation of a social setup which, concentra which concentrates wealth and power in the hands of a few. Yeah, so that's... Uh, that's what's happening. <laughs> um, all right, so what do Marxist critics do? Um, well, they do a couple of things. They make a division between the overt, that is what it's manifest or on the surface, and covert, latent or hidden content of literary work, as much as psychoanalytic critics do, and then relate the covert subject matter of the literary work to the basic Marxist themes, for example, class struggle over the progression of society through various historical stages, such as the transition from feudalism to industrial capitalism. Let me give an example of this. So uh, you all may remember that our base text, of course, is Edgar Allan Poe's The uh, Oval Portrait, right? <clears throat> and so if you recall, uh, the narrator and his uh, valet or valet, Pedro, um, they go to this chateau and we learn that he is given a drug by Pedro, his valet, because he has a wound, uh, right? <clears throat> and this drug will cause him to have incipient delirium. But in Marxist terms, what you would do is you go, okay, wait a minute. We need to remember that this is a guy who just came out of, you know, some kind of military conflict. In other words, he got wounded, you know, so maybe he's an officer because he has a manservant, a valet, um, you know, but he, he was just recently in some kind of skirmish, right? And in fact, if you go read the original uh, that was called Life and Death. Uh, the entire first part of this, right? Uh, that's not, you know, because the story begins right here at the chateau into which Pedro adventured to make forcible entrance, right? Blah, blah, blah. That, that's where the Poe story, as we have it in the Barry chapter, begins. But the first published version here talks about uh, right here, my valet and sole attendant in the lonely chateau was too nervous and too grossly unskilled to venture upon letting blood, which is the common way of trying to supposedly heal someone, of which indeed I'd already lost too much in the affray with a banditti or banditti or bandits. So there has been a military or some kind of, you know, uh, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, some kind of um, repressive state apparatus action going on. And that's how you might, you know, bring to the fore something that is covert in this story to the foreground and say, well, look, you know, the whole kind of <clears throat> uh, predication of this guy appearing in this very rich and lavish chateau, by the way, which should tell you something about 
you know, the class structure at the time. Uh, and this guy, you know, is living in a kind of quasi feudal era, you know, uh, feudalism, you know, where he has a, a manservant. Um, and you, you talk about those themes in terms of Marx's problems of class struggle. So clearly they're vendetti and why are they vendetti? Well, typically they're bandits because, you know, uh, like in most crime ridden areas, uh, there are those who have and those who have not, right? And uh, the, the thieves, the bandits, you know, whether Robin Hood or not, they're gonna take it. And, uh, you know, we see that in the story. So that's one way you could apply Marxist criticism. Another way, another method used by Marxist critics is to relate the context of a social, uh, excuse me, of a work to the social class status of the author. In such cases, an assumption is made, which again is similar to those made by psychoanalytic critics, psychoanalytic critics, that the author is unaware of precisely what he or she is saying or revealing in the text. And they may be aware. Uh, so if you wanted to take that tact or strategy and relate it to Poe himself, um, you know, as the author. Um, I don't know if you all know, but Poe was not only in the military, but, uh, and, you know, he ended up being, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, I don't know, uh, proficient. <laughs> Uh, so much so that he eventually was in uh, what we call West Point or the Military Academy. Um, so you can see here his military career. Uh, <clears throat> he enlisted in the army, right? Um, eventually, right, uh, had an appointment at you know West Point. Uh, but he, he left West Point you know, of his own accord. But what that should remind us of is that he himself had military training and experience, and therefore he would be able to kind of put his mind as an author in the mindset of someone who, like his character, narrator, is fleeing the banditti. Uh, so yeah, that's a way to perhaps read that story. Anyhow, um, let's go ahead and move from the Barry chapter to actual Marx and Engels, and then we'll look at Althusser. So before we look at Marx and Engels, uh, let's look at the question that is being asked in this uh, uh, letter A here. So uh, unfortunately, the way that this PDF rendered, what it does is it broke this, this diagram here in two. Uh, so I have a, another image of it. Uh, I'll show you here. <clears throat> it says, uh, to what extent do you agree, if at all, with Karl Marx's assertion in the German ideology that life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life? So that's what this diagram is trying to represent here. The schematic of this reality would look thus like. So let me uh, find that image for you here that's not broken. So this is <clears throat> what it looks like. Um, so so look at it again, life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. So you have to think for a second, okay, which is he saying comes first? And then in turn, which one is he arguing for? So he's saying life, like your, you know, physicality, uh, you know, what he might call material existence, that is not determined by your consciousness, your, you know, what's in your head, your reality, so to speak. So he's saying, it's not this part, it's not the top part, which is you have a consciousness, you have a reality in your mind, right? 
uh, therefore, which is, by the way, that's the, uh, the triple dots like that. That's the therefore symbol. Um, then instead, you know, you end up having your physical life, you know, what we Marxists might call life, <laughs> cultural material life. So one way to think about this section here is according to people who are religious, whether you're a Buddhist, a Taoist, Muslim, Christian, so on, um, there is this sort of preformed thing you might call the soul uh, or an essence, if you will, that makes you who you are. Uh, and therefore that soul ends up creating your life, you know? This is a common kind of, uh, if you go back in historical records or it's even used today, um, well, he was just, or she was born like that, right? That somehow it was, you know, part of your literal, you know, DNA. Um, but if you remember, you know, think of the word consciousness according to uh, Freud, right? It means like what, what's in your actual perceptual world, okay? Uh, and therefore everything that goes into it. So if you're raised as a Christian, right? From a very early age, like I was, right? Baptized Presbyterian, went to Catholic school, even though I wasn't Catholic, uh, you know, uh, went to my grandparents' Baptist church periodically. So that becomes part of your consciousness, your worldview. And then that worldview, your consciousness creates the life that you live. Okay. But Marx is going to say, no, 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 it's not this. But instead, right, he says, consciousness is determined by life, right? Which means you have to turn these two things around, which is what the last part is. But instead it is, first you have life, your physical, actual life, where you're born with polio. That will certainly affect your life, <laughs> your material existence. Um, were you born blind? Were you born to uh, an upper class family? Were you born as an orphan? Were you, again, like I said earlier, uh, you know, did you have good, good health and education and, and all of these things that we sort of often take for granted in our first world country? Um, and all of that, all of your material life, will then, according to Marx, form what he calls consciousness or, you know, what, again, Marxists will call reality. So in my mind, uh, I mean, you can believe what you think, but if I were to be answering this question, I would first say, well, yes, I actually do agree with Marx, right? Because um, because that's what it's asking here, do you agree, if at all, with, with this notion that life creates your consciousness? So like, I mean, here, let me give you an example. Um, I have a bunch of uh, pictures of that guy I voted for twice named Barack Obama. Um, you know, when we had a, actual decent president in the office. Not that Biden's terrible, he was his vice president, right? So, so this is his mom, right? Um, you know, he is literally African hyphen American because his father, um, it's another image of him, of, of, of them together. Uh, his, his father is from Kenya, right? So, you know, that already right there 
is part of his material life of literally how his you know genetics and cultural heritage was formed um <laughs> you know obama is superman um you know he ends up being in the white house not because he was born that way right like as the other paradigm suggests, like, oh, it's, he's destined to be, it's part of his soul or consciousness. Uh, but he lived a material life and culture that allowed him to rise to that level. Now, not without hard work, obviously, right? Like here he is actually working at his desk, things on his desk, on the phone, which I don't recall seeing a lot of with the, um, you know, our number 45 president, dare say I, dare I say his name. Um, so yeah, there's the uh, husband and wife. So the reason I'm pointing this out is he, if you look at his background, was educated in really elite circumstances. He first started off at Occidental College in uh, California. Um, uh, where is it? Yeah. So, right. He went to Occidental for a while. Uh, and then he transferred to Columbia, right? Where he got his Bachelor of Arts. Now, Columbia is one of the eight Ivy League universities in the nation, along with Harvard and Yale. And, um, and then after earning his bachelor's degree, he goes to Harvard Law, right? Because he's already, you know, gone to one of the eight Ivy Leagues, right? And Harvard Law School, uh, JD standing for, you know, Juris Doctor. Um, Harvard Law is probably, along with Yale, but probably Harvard is, is the most difficult law school to get into. And while he was there, he didn't just... <laughs> Uh, you know, go to law school, he became the editor of the Harvard Review. That's not listed in here, but he, but he did. So the Harvard Review is uh, like every law school uh, has its own law journal, you know. Uh, <clears throat> oh, that's not the one. it's there it is <clears throat> so he was an editor of this right and so you have to have some real um, legal chops you know that you can see here columbia has one yale has one pan all of the you know pretty much all decent law schools have one right so what i'm saying is like this guy didn't you know just somehow magically as the paradigm might suggest spring into, you know, becoming president of the United States. Um, he was in the right place at the right time and also, yes, worked hard, okay? So what I'm trying to point out with this question is that um, <clears throat> his life, right, based on, again, his family, his education, upbringing and so on, um, that allowed him to go to places like Columbia and Harvard, right? It literally shaped his reality, you know? Um, if you are educated at Harvard, the doors to the world sort of open for you, you know, uh, opportunities and possibilities. Whereas if you're educated or not educated for that matter, uh, doors are difficult to open or they remain shut. 
So yes, I would tend to agree with uh, Marx. And then I go on to ask, do you see any difficulty in accepting this proposition that before we can have a sense of consciousness, that is a sense of self to put it in Freudian terms, we must first have in place the material conditions or life that therefore produce consciousness. And I only ask this latter question because I'm allowing you and if you want, you know, certainly to disagree, to say, yeah, yeah, no, uh, I think that if I buy into, for example, uh, Christian theology of predestination, that God has a plan and everything has been predetermined, literally like who I would be born to, what kind of life I will have and where I will die and how I would die. If that's all been, you know, part of the, the bigger master plan, then you can say, yeah, no, I don't agree with Marx, right? Um, but I, you know, would like to, to understand or ha ask you to explain why, what, you know, <laughs> Yeah, other than, you know, if you say, because it's my faith, it's what I believe, uh, then that, that kind of argument goes nowhere. Because uh, we can go like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, it's almost like standing in a court of law and saying, well, I was predestined to kill that person because, you know, God, it was in God's plan, you know. I don't think uh, many judges would buy that or juries for that matter. So uh, when you're thinking about Marx, uh, you know, think about that question. So Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels are central figures in the history of literary criticism and theory and in the development of cultural studies, though neither produced a body of literary critical work. Uh, they're more sort of social, historical, and economic theorists. Um, to many, it may seem perverse to study Marxist theory today, given the collapse between 1989 and 1991 of communist governments in the Soviet Union and in the nations of Eastern Europe. Uh, by the way, put myself on pause. Uh, this is why Putin is in Ukraine right now because Ukraine used to belong to the former Soviet Union. And remember that Putin, you know, got his start as a KGB agent in the Soviet Union. Continuing, but we must clearly distinguish between Marx and Engels as social theorists, philosophers, historians, and cultural critics, and as revolutionaries, or more accurately, as revolutionaries under whose name communist leaders and parties seize power, right? Remember the whole thing about Lenin earlier that uh, Marx and Engels ideas were co-opted and used for Lenin's purposes. Uh, that's what they're meaning here by leaders and parties who seize power. The fall of particular regimes, Marxists more in name than in ideas does little to lessen the impact of Marx's relentless, fascinated, shocked, and shocking ex examination of capitalism and its cost to the men and women caught in its grasp, meaning us, since we're all pretty much all workers. Marx emphasized that he is concerned primarily with the material conditions of life, which I just mentioned in that discussion about Obama the economic structure of society. On this foundation rises a legal and political superstructure. Moreover, the mode of production of material life conditions, the social, political, and the intellectual life process in general. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their beings, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. That's exactly what we just discussed in this uh, in this diagram here. So, um, in a letter to Joseph Block, our final selection, Engels, his counterpart, <coughs> uh, Friedrich Engels writing to Joseph Block, maintains that according to the materialist conception of history, and that's what 
Marx and Engels practiced or believed a material conception of history, as do I actually. <clears throat> the ultimately determining element in history is the production and reproduction of life. Insisting that economics is not the only determinant and leaving room for the influence of human minds. This is where we get into the ideological state apparatuses of like family, religion, media, and so on. Um, okay, so uh, there's that notion of dialectic again. They base their interpretation of reality on dialectical materialism, believing that all change results from a constant conflict or class struggle arising from the opposition inherent in all ideas, movements, and events. They further, argue, further argued that the internal tensions and contradictions in capitalism would lead inevitably to its demise. Now this right here, this last sentence, I'm gonna read that again. They further argued that the internal tensions and contradictions in capitalism would lead inevitably to its demise. That is precisely why Marxism gets its bad rap today in the United States or most uh, Western type free market economies because what Marx and Engels are pointing out is that um, based on the way in which capitalism inherently and by its very nature exploits its labor or us, its laborers, and thus alienates us, you know, keeps us at a re remove and, you know, uh, we're not full human beings, you know, we're inhumane, we are human resources, as I mentioned. Um, based on that, eventually the wealthier get wealthier and or the wealthy get wealthier and the poor get poor, which we are seeing in the past, I don't know, decade or so dramatically that the wealth income gap has skyrocketed uh, and continues to, uh, let's see. Let's see, uh, to find a reliable source here. I just don't uh, go to any, here you go, here's uh, Pew Research, you know, the, the polls that the Pew Research does, or you can even look at uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, the actual, you know, monetary, uh, but as you can see, right? So this image, yeah. <clears throat> so household, incomes have resumed growing following the Great Recession. Uh, and the Great Recession, you know, uh, we're talking about uh, roughly 2008, 2009. Um, and so median household income has been adjusted, right? Uh, that's not the income gap I was referring to. Yeah, there you go. That's what I was talking about. I was thinking that there would be a graph, um, but this is basically what I was saying. All right, so over the last several decades, incomes of the top 5% of earners, so a little bit more than the top 1%, have increased faster than the income of other families, duh. Because you know, if you have a lot of money, you can then reinvest it and you know, or an interest off that, you know, that's what stocks are or your 401k. And the more money you have to do that, the more you're going to earn wealth. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a troubling problem in our economy. And uh, I don't know about this image here, but anyway, it, it's a real thing. Um, and you guys may be all too well aware of it. Yeah, that, that's just insane. So this is from Forbes magazine, you know, the, the business. Uh, 
not allowing for a, but you can increase the size here, right? So it's kind of crazy uh, that, you know, these people, wealth of the richest US individuals and billions, 160 billion is here. Billion, not, not million, billion. Ah, so uh, this is, you know, again, that capitalism would never really lead to its demise, that we, the proletariat, the workers will eventually get wise and overthrow the 1% or the top earners. Hopefully, at some point. Otherwise, we'll just be continue to be cogs in a wheel. Um, the industrial, industrial capitalist economy, says Marx, alienates individuals from the work they do, unable to control their own labor, which they must give or sell to another, which we do, right? That's what your paycheck is. It's like, okay, here's you know the value of your labor. They lack control and knowledge of themselves and never achieve their full human potential. However much they resent their situation, they believe, that is, they are conditioned to believe by the ISAs that it cannot be changed and that ultimately they have only themselves to blame for their discontent and failures. So you, you see a lot of people with anxiety and depression these days. Well, yeah, you can think, capitalism and hegemony because until we all band together as workers we can't change it you know one person does not an army make so um yeah let me just jump to the chase here where uh marx says this in the uh the german ideology and we only have a short excerpt from it he says, <clears throat> the social structure and the state are continually evolving out of the life process of definite individuals, that is of actual people, but of individuals, meaning, you know, and all <laughs> people not, not out of, you know, mythical things like unicorns and other things you might read in sacred texts. Uh, not as they may appear in their own or other people's imagination, right? In other words, we're not making up people here. We're talking about actual real people. But as they really are, that is, as they operate, produce materially, and hence, as they work under definite material limits, presuppositions, and conditions independent of their will, right? When you go to work, all of us, there are limits to what we can and cannot do. There are presuppositions about what is expected of us, what is not expected of us, uh, how much labor we're supposed to, or productivity we're supposed to have. Uh, and there are conditions, right? Uh, you have to you know, sign all kinds of forms and orientation and whatnot just to have a job. The production of ideas, of conceptions, of consciousness, is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men and women, the language of real life. In other words, it's going back to what I just said earlier about Obama, for example, that it's, you know, it's obvious, but he has to state it here. It, you know, our, our brains, our reality, our consciousness, right, uh, is literally interwoven with and part and parcel of the physicality or material of our life. <clears throat> the same applies to mental production as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, etc., of a people. Men are the producers of their conceptions, ideas, etc. I want to pause there and ask you, you know, rhetorically, because you can't answer. Excuse me. <clears throat> Drinking some water here. <clears throat> um, ask you if you agree with that. This last line: Men or human beings are the producers of their conceptions, ideas, etc. 
what he, you know, kind of puts in et cetera could be uh, religious beliefs, you know, that those are things that people believe, those are concepts, those are ideas. So he's saying that man, human beings produce those. I'm wondering if you agree. Uh, a Marxist would say yes. Uh, a staunch non-Marxist would probably say no to hold on to that which they believe is real. Consciousness can never be anything else than conscious existence, right? I mean, it just makes sense. That is, you're, you know, go back to Freud, you know, what is above the surface is consciousness, right? What is below the surface is your unconscious or unconsciousness. Um, so consciousness can never be anything else other than conscious existence. And the existence of man, people, is their actual life process of you know your day-to-day, year-to-year life. If in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from the historical life process as the inversion of objects on the retina does from their physical life process, which is this idea I read earlier. Uh, and you go down to the footnote and it tells you about that image I showed you, right? That it's <clears throat> camera obscura, meaning literally dark chamber. There's an apparatus invented in the 17th century consisting of a dark in box with an aperture using a lens through which an image is projected inverted on the opposite wall. So it's the inverted or upside, dim, upside down part that is important for ideology. Um, so then he goes on to say, because it's a very short section, as you see here, it, it ends right here. And by the way, I skipped over this in the introduction, but so this was written between Engels and, and Marx in the middle of roughly uh, the 1800s, but it wasn't published until well after World War I. And you have to sort of ask yourself, well, what? Why is that? Because um, it was dangerous, right? That is to say, to capitalism, remember, 1840s is right at this sort of, not at the beginning, but sort of early on, we should say, think maybe early 1800s. <clears throat> Uh, so a few dec decades into what we call the Industrial Revolution, you know, the steam engine was, uh, you know, making railroad uh, possible and so on. Um, so industry as we know it and labor, because human beings have to work for their food now, um, rather than, you know, if you were, you owned your own land or you were, you know, in a kind of, uh, communal system where everybody worked and shared the food or shared the wealth. Uh, but now we have to work for our labor. But what I'm pointing out here is that in the Industrial Revolution era, right, when they started writing, capitalists were like, whoa, 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 we can't be having these ideas come about and being public. So uh, it was dangerous to literally the state and the government, right? Again, think of, you know, the bourgeoisie, the 1%, uh, the whole Occupy Wall Street movement. They don't want us to wake up or be woke, you might say. So uh, it was published much later, uh, unfortunately. Uh, in this last paragraph here, in direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth. So that was pointed out in very earlier what is called idealistic philosophy and what is meant by that is um, an idealist philosophy it comes from like heaven down to us in other words god exists or my soul exists because god has created it and therefore i am here on earth because something in heaven has created me or us um, so instead of that right? Uh, here we ascend from earth to heaven, 
In other words, it's the other way around, he says. That is to say, we do not set out from what men say, imagine, conceive, nor from men as narrated, thought of, imagined, conceived in order to arrive at men in their flesh. We set out from real active men and on the basis of their real life process, we demonstrate the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of this life process. In other words, it's just a long detailed way of saying like we are as like social theorists really looking at how labor and owners of means of production and like how it's actually functioning in the factory and so on, which they did. The phantoms or imagined forms in the human brain are also necessary sublimates of the material life process. In other words, things that we imagine or think of, whether it's God or I believe in, uh, you know, the American flag and patriotism and so on. Um, those are sublimates, meaning sort of sublimated in your brain, your mind, uh, using Freudian terms. The phantoms formed in the human brain are also necessarily sublimates of their material life process, which is empirically verifiable and bound to material premises. For example, morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness thus no longer retain the semblance of independence, right? They're not like religion, morality, metaphysics, meaning, you know, is there a God? Uh, so they're not separate from us. Therefore, they're not independent. They are interdependent on us and vice versa. They have no history, no development, but men developing their material production and their material intercourse alter along with this, their real ex existence, their thinking and the products of their thinking. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. So what he's saying here is that what I just explained earlier, um, we as human beings change, alter, right? Along with our real existence, the thinking of human beings. I mean, just go back and look at you know, within Christianity, the evolution of the Bible. Um, you know, there's an entire set of books that originally were part of the Bible. Um, they were called the Apocrypha, uh, right? So biblical books received by the early church, but not included by, you know, current versions. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a tricky thing to say like, oh, wait, so there were certain books in the Bible that were accepted as true, legit, and now they are not. <laughs> right, who's, who's making those decisions? Um, let's see if, uh, right? <clears throat> so there's uh, a book called uh, the book of Esther, right? Uh, that's not in the Bible, but used to be. Uh, the book of uh wisdom the book of judith like there are no books in the bible by women right uh these are you know the most of the old testament but but all of these books here in the middle um they were originally kind of uh kicked to the curb or no excuse me they originally accepted but then they were uh kicked to the curb by different councils of the christian church so anyway, my, my point is, is that Marx has, he has a point here, <laughs> you know, that we do change as human beings, our thinking that in turn later shape other people's ideology and thinking. Okay, um, let me go ahead and move on to Althusser, because that kind of does it for Marx. Um, so this question here of Althusser, is asking about the ISAs and RSAs. Um, 
so remember that ISAs are the ideological state apparatus and the RSA is the repressive state apparatus. And I ask, well, let's say Louis Althusser argues that there are repressive you know, RSAs and ISAs. <clears throat> he then goes on to argue that all ideology hails or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects. Uh, and those are his italics. Because ideology acts or functions in a way that it recruits subjects, and we are subjects, by the way, among the individuals, it recruits them all, or it transforms the individual into subjects, it transforms them all by that very precise operation, which I have called interpolation or hailing, and which can be imagined along the lines of the most commonplace everyday police or other hailing. So imagine you're walking on the street and the police goes, hey, you there, what do you do? You typically turn around and stop, right? You're being interpolated by the hegemony, right? When that happens. So all of this is a, that's why this question is so long. All of this is a direct quote from Althusser. So I ask, first of all, do you agree that RSAs and ISAs exist just because an author says something exists doesn't mean you have to buy into it. Secondly, do you agree with also Sarah that these RSAs and ISAs transform us from individuals, you know, our own supposedly free thinking, free will individuals to subjects of the state, right? Um, I mean, think of that term in terms of, you know, if you're thinking of the queen of England, right? She will look out of her Buckingham Palace and go, I gaze upon all of my subjects, right? Because all of the British citizens are literally her subjects. And this is uh, uh, what connotation Althusser is using here, that we are literally subjects of the state or the government. Uh, so if you agree, then how or in what ways do you see this interpolation occurring? This, this hailing, right? Are you there? In other words, uh, in art, in film and television, you know, I'd kind of like to keep it in the artistic, perhaps literary realm. Uh, how do you see this happening? I mean, if, if you can't think of any, you want to answer this question, you can't think of any uh, actual literary or cinematic versions, though it happens all the time, um, TV, film, and so on. Uh, then you could think of actual real life of how we are interpolated. So let's go look at Althusser to see how he talks about this, uh, if you want to answer this question. So he says here, following you know, on the heels of Marx, uh, Althusser held that the task of the philosopher was to represent the class struggle in theory, not in theory, like hypothetically, but in like literary theory or critical theory taking the side of the oppressed in ongoing ideological struggles with representatives of the ruling class. So like Marx, he's looking out for us. All through series, major concepts, ideological state apparatuses, interpolation, which we're talking about in this question that I just, just asked, right? Um, and overdetermination, which I explained earlier, all of these permeate the discourse of contemporary literary and cultural theory. And his theory of ideology has influenced virtually all subsequent serious work on the topic. The problem Althusser sets out to solve an ideology and this ideological state apparatus that is the work we have here in this essay uh, is to determine how society reproduces its basic social relations, thereby ensuring its continuing existence uh, is a perennial one in social theory, raises early as Plato. So what Althusser is really, or really right here, this page, what is it, 1333, uh, is still part of the editor's introduction to Althusser. What they're pointing out is that 
um, Althusser is getting at a kind of fundamental problem of society, which is how does this society, civilization, government, how does it continue its existence, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people call this the American, or excuse me, democracy uh, in America as an experiment. You know, America is the, you know, experiment in democracy uh, or the democratic experiment. Uh, experiment because in the past, uh, whether it's you know the Athenian democracy of Athens in the golden era of Greece, um, those forms of democracies obviously did not last. So you know we're now two hundred years plus into our American experiment of democracy, and how do we continue that existence? Right, so. What Althusser is looking at are the social relations of how we continue to perpetuate, in this case, America. Um, so he says here, Althusser famously terms the societal mechanism for creating pliant, obedient citizens, that's us, whose practice, who practice dominant values he calls these ideological state apparatuses or ISAs. Complex, numerous, and differing from one society to another, they are civil institutions that have legal standing, hence their designation as state apparatuses, right? Like, you know, the courts, or uh, if I go back to this up here, right? Uh, <clears throat> you know, education, What it, what is, the university you're enrolled in called Grambling State University or Louisiana State University. I mean, it doesn't even have the state in it. If it's a public institution, it's a state institution. But even if it's a private institution, um, Harvard, Yale, uh, you know, Concordia down the road in Shreveport or, uh, you know, uh, a, a bunch of private universities around the nation, they take, not a bunch, they all do, uh, they take federal dollars and funding, right? <clears throat> if they want to have any kind of, um, you know, men's sports, they also have to have women's sports as part of the Title IX, right? Federal law, Civil Rights Act. Um, so going back to this, um, <clears throat> They have legal standing, hence their designation as state apparatuses, including churches, schools, the family, courts, political parties, unions, the media, sports, and the arts. <clears throat> ISAs differ from repressive state apparatuses or RSAs, such as the police, the military, the prison system, the government, in several key ways. They are not unified, right? Um, you know, they are, you know, kind of on their own, you know, there's the Pentagon, there's, uh, well, we recently kind of coalesced a lot under the umbrella of Department of Homeland Security, so now that includes FBI and other things, but they're typically separate, you know, kind of entities. Uh, every state has its own, you know, National Guard. Anyway, um, you know, police departments or their own police departments. It's not like, you know, the Texas State Police Department or Louisiana State Police Department. It's their Louisiana State Troopers, right? But every individual municipality has its own police department is what I'm pointing out. Uh, also, uh, they operate primarily in the private sphere um, and they attain their power by not by means of explicit coercion or force, but through the implicit consent realized in accepted practices. So this is exactly what I was mentioning earlier about uh, in terms of hegemony. When you believe you have a choice between, you know, this color or that color or this politician and that politician, uh, it's really not true because we've already given our implicit consent in these categories. Um, 
one tacitly means, you know, sort of quietly and implicitly, one tacitly learns the practice of obedience to authority, for example, in church, in school, at home, or in sports teams, right? If you misbehave in those places, there are disciplinary actions that can occur. All right. Um, in the ideological state apparatus essay here, and there are lots of ex excerpts. Um, I'm going to yeah, this section right here. <clears throat> this is where he lays out the ISAs versus the RSAs. Uh, what are the ideological state apparatuses? They must not be confused with the repressive state apparatus. Remember that in Marxist theory, the state apparatus or SA contains the government, the administration, the army, the police, the courts, the prison system, etc., which constitute what I shall in future call the repressive state apparatus. Repressive suggests that the state apparatus in question functions by violence, right? All of these function by violence. There's not a one that doesn't, that if you get out of line in any one of these, there are physical consequences. Not always, but they are imbued with these categories, are imbued with the power to physically detain, in some cases, kill you. Um, continuing, uh, they function by violence, at least ultimately, since repression, for example, administrative repression, may take on non-physical forms, right? That <clears throat> a non-physical form of repression is, you know, when uh, we have courts, right? There, there's both civil and criminal court. So in a civil court case, you might be fined, let's say, but it's still, uh, that's, that's economic repression, right? It's still uh, taking your money away. I shall call ideological state apparatuses a certain number of realities which present themselves to the immediate observer in the form of distinct and specialized institutions. We can for the moment regard the following institutions as ideological state apparatuses. The order in which I have listed them has no particular significance. So they all kind of are networked, right? There's the religious, right? Churches and all manner of churches, regardless of what religion, you know, uh, a Buddhist temple, uh, Islamic mosque, Jewish synagogue, Christian church, right? They're all part of the religious religious ISA, educational ISA. Everything from Head Start to doctoral education, professional education. The family ISA, well, that's pretty clear what that is, right? Whether you're immediate, but also your extended family as well. The legal ISA, um, political, the political system, including different parties, trade unions, communications, press, radio, television. Now we have to include the internet and social media, uh, cultural ISAs, literature, arts, so this is why uh, right here, this literature arts, um, the cultural ISA, why it's important for us as in, or in literary criticism and doing literary criticism to think about ISAs, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to ask ourselves to what degree is art, capital A, um, as it is written here, uh, to what degree is art or literature produced either for the state in a kind of like propagandistic way, or is it art that is criticizing, critiquing culture and the state, right? Um, you can have both, certainly. So um, I have said that the ISAs must not be confused with the RSAs, right? What constitutes a difference? At the first moment, it is clear that while there is one repressive state apparatus, 
there is a plurality of ideological state apparatuses. Even presupposing that it exists, the unity that contributes this plurality of ISAs as a body is not immediately visible. And so this is what he's kind of talking about here. Like these are all different things, you know, radio and television and social media, right? Those are all different things in media, print, magazine, and so on. Uh, but they are all interconnected is what he's saying. They're not really independent, you know. Uh, what your family allows you to view in terms of mass media, whether it's on the computer or on your phone or what magazines or publications are in your home is based on your family dynamic and situation. Okay, so I think that's pretty clear. Um, <clears throat> the idea of an ISA versus RSA. And then I want to go to the uh, interpolation part. I'm just going to jump right to it, which is <clears throat> So this is on uh, <clears throat> page 1356. I shall then suggest the ideology, and remember, all of these things produce ideology, and ideology itself is a false consciousness or upside down camera obscura, so it's a false way of thinking. I, su I shall then suggest that ideology acts or functions in such a way that it recruits, like, you know, it beckons you and sometimes not just beckons, but like draws you in without your, uh, you know, consent and does it in a very kind of subtle, surreptitious, stealthy way. I shall suggest then that ideology acts or functions in such a way that it recruits subjects among the individuals. It recruits them all, that is all of us, or transforms the individual into subjects. It transforms them all or transforms all of us by that very precise operation, which I have called interpolation or hailing, and which can be imagined along the lines of the most commonplace everyday police or other hailing, hey you there, right? So uh, you have to read the, the footnote here. It says a hailing as an everyday practice subject to precise ritual takes a quite special form in the policeman's practice of hailing, which concerns the hailing of suspects, right? Um, in other words, there are different kinds of hailing, obviously, you know? Uh, for example, I'll, I'll give an example of interpolation, right? Of where you are recruited and you've already, or we, I should say, I should include myself, uh, already give our consent. You're driving down I-20 or you're driving down the interstate and the speed limit is clearly 70. However, you know that you are doing 80 or 85. And as soon as you come over a hill and you see the popo, you see the police, whether state trooper or sheriff or deputy or whatever, what do you do? You have an immediate bodily reaction of taking your foot off the gas, of trying to say, no, no, I wasn't speeding. Please don't stop me. I'm conforming. I am therefore being interpolated, right? Uh, you come to a four-way stop and you actually stop at the stop sign, right? You just don't plow through it because you sort of know in the back of your head that if I run the red light, there either might be a camera, again, big brother watching you, or um, you know there might be police around the corner and seeing you, but in either case, you are being recruited or interpolated as Arthur Sarah says, and so you conform. Even if I would wager that most of us we came to a red light in the middle of the night and no one is around 
two, three o'clock in the morning, dark road, traffic, red traffic light, you stop, right? You like, you know, even after you've proceeded beyond the intersection, there is still one's no one around, you still stop. That is giving your consent to being governed by the state. That's what Arthur Sarah is talking about. So um, that's that question. Do you believe on the one hand that, you know, do you agree that they exist? Uh, and if so, what are some ways that you see interpolation occurring, ideally in literature, whether through, like I pointed out with the Poe story, you know, of the narrator being interpolated. I mean, Poe himself joining the military, going to West Point. I mean, he's clearly being interpolated. He's becoming a tool or, you know, part of the repressive state apparatus himself. Then finally, the last question, if you want to answer that, is one of those kind of open-ended questions where I'm trying to, uh, you know, let you do a little kind of critique, if you will, of Marxism, just because Marxism exists and I happen to buy into a lot of its precepts doesn't mean you have to. So I ask here, so Marxist criticism presupposes that a text is always already political, that there's no way you can not think about the characters being involved in some kind of economic or class situation, which is true because, you know, think of any kind of Jane Austen, Jane Austen novel or other kind of situations where um, the government or, you know, someone in, is in jail, right? That's always political. Think of the ISAs and RSAs there, or even the author, right? A text is always political. Or in other words, there is no way to read a text, whether novel, play, blah, 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 without automatically considering the political factors that went into producing the text. Again, the political factors of the author, him or herself, or how the author is portraying the implotment of quote unquote reality in the novel. So if this is true, if this presupposition is true that everything is always already political. Do you find any limitations to it? In other words, uh, would this reading be restrictive or you know, limiting or liberating? Um, for some people, it would be really restrictive to say, well, if I always have to think that a text, whether you know, an advertisement, a billboard, a speech or whatever is always political, then I can never get outside of the, well, ideology to use the Marxist term, which in Marxism is true. You can never get outside of ideology. Um, you could say, well, I'm going to convert from Judaism to Christianity. And then Marx would say, well, you're just substituting one ideology for another ideology. Or you might say, well, I'm going to switch from being uh, a Democrat to a quote unquote independent. Uh, and Marx and Marxists would say, well, you're just shifting one political party for a supposed uh, another political party, because by and large, when you go to the polling uh, place, you're going to find a two party system where you're going to have to vote for a Democrat or Republican. Once in a while, there'll be a liberal, excuse me, an a, a independent candidate, but he or she often either isn't on the ballot or if he or she is elected, they often function just like a Republican or Democrat, even though their name is quote unquote independent. Anyhow, uh, so you can answer this question if you wanted to. All right, folks, uh, that's it for this module six uh, that is due this coming Monday, the 21st. All right, take care. Bye.